When it comes to end times, there's always questions. There's always debates. When it comes to end times, I saw Zach. Where's Zach at? He left. He left. Oh, he's stuck in end times. I'm out of here. As I mentioned yesterday, me and Zach, we go way back. And um, we are just good friends. There's just no way around it. And um, we started home studying a long time ago. And um, even then, he was, I remember him talking about the 144,000 being children. I looked at him going, okay. And then I'd say something, he'd look at me, you know, and we'd go back and forth and having fun. There's always going to be differences. And I was talking to someone yesterday. I even have teachings that contradict my other teachings. And now, here, that sounds funny, because it is funny. But here's the thing. It's not like a contradiction. What I'm going to say is, look, if this is the way it's supposed to be interpreted, we've got to look at this perspective. And I put that out there. Then all of a sudden, four or five months down the road, hey guys, here's another perspective. We need to look at this one, because what if this is wrong and that wrong, and this one could be right. So I have got multiple teachings that say, this could be a season you should, you should be watching, because this could be this, this, and this. And then it can lead into this and this, and it all explains why. So it's not like they contradict that's showing the options of how things will work out. That's why I won't take them down. I want to leave them all up. Because I believe when it comes to end times, have all your options on the table. Don't be stuck on one. That's a great way to be deceived. Because if you're sold on one perspective and it doesn't work out, then what do you do? <laughs> I don't know. And I still have questions on things. I scratch my head all the time. Look how much I scratch my head. <laughs> All the time. I don't have the answers. I'm trying to get them. Okay? But we need to be very willing to say, boy, that's a perspective I never thought of. You don't have to agree with it. Keep it on the back burner and think, boy, I want to keep this. Just consider it. Huh? You know what I'm saying? So those are things we have to do. Now, um, are the river ones in here? There, I, I heard there. Uh, someone they spoke yesterday. I missed their presentation. I'm bumming that I did, and they were saying how evidently they are looking at like a 2030 or 33, something like that. There's lots of timelines. I've heard 2024, 2028, and now I've heard the 2030 element, and then I've heard 2044, uh, 45, those years. Okay, and I've heard lots of arguments, and I I don't say they're wrong. I, I'll say I don't see it. But that doesn't make me right either. Just as much as I think I've got several perspectives and I don't know which one's right, the same principle applies for when it could happen. That's like one of my, my winter timeline teaching. I show when things happen, this will be the order. Okay? No matter when it starts, this will be a similar order of how it will work out. All right. I, I strongly encourage you, matter of fact, we'll try to look at that a little bit uh, perspective. So um, if I say something that just kind of rubs you the wrong way, don't take it the wrong way. Take it as something, gee, I never thought of that. I need to pray about it. That's all I'm asking you, okay? Now, um, real quick, and then we'll get into the, uh, the questions, um, because I had lots of comments and, and thoughts, and people was like blown away when I made this teaching. And let me bring up my keynote. In order to make sure you see it all real good, I'm not gonna go complete full screen. I'm going to just blow it up. This is the one year time frame. Okay, how it works, so let me go ahead and just enlarge it just a little bit. Okay, that's too much. Um, excuse me. Let's do that. A little better. Okay. Follow my mouse, if you will. You can see right here, um, I'm not going to get into all the minor details, okay, but Yeshua comes, okay, and I think it's going to come just before Purim element, and I have a teaching simply titled The Assyrian. If you have not seen that teaching, it is crucial. For you to understand the end times, it is crucial. Why? Because people think Israel is going to be undefeated. Folks, Israel gets defeated. It says that it gets almost like two, three, three fourths, I forgot what the, the actual number is, but it gets wiped out. Okay? All but, all but defeated. And then what happens? It rises up. This is the Assyrian who comes in and conquers. And in my opinion, I also mentioned this in my teaching, uh, Satan's Greatest Masquerade. If you want to understand Daniel 9.27, watch Daniel, I mean, Satan's Greatest Masquerade. Satan's Greatest Masquerade will blow your mind if you think 
you understand Daniel line 27. Because we have not been looking at it from a Hebraic perspective. We have been not looking at the Hebrew words that are mentioned there. Okay, and I wish I had time to break into it, but I can't reteach that teaching. I, I encourage you. I even, I even explained, that teaching explains why Yeshua has blood on him when he crosses over Mount, Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. Have you ever thought about that? Why does he have blood on him when he's coming through to conquer Jerusalem, okay, and to, to win, and he's, he's the conquering Savior here? Why does he have blood on him? Because he already fought the Battle of Armoed, which is also called the Battle of Armageddon, as you probably know it as, down at Mount Sinai. You see, Yeshua, this conference is all about the enemy known from the beginning, okay? When Yahweh brought his people out of Egypt, what did he do? He took them to Mount Sinai. To what? Enter, enter in the covenant, the marriage covenant. He says, I will be your husband. There's a new movement out there saying, they're really not, they were never married. I'm going, what? Also, when Yahweh says, I'm your husband, he was lying. He said that to Israel, I am your husband. And then when he divorced them, oh, well, that's just, you know, that's just a metaphor. That's all metaphors. That's why Yahweh talks in metaphors to show us how he loves us. Are we really his children? It's metaphors. Okay, everything is metaphors. He uses metaphors to show us how he reaches out to us. So, just as he took his people out of Egypt and entered into covenant, he will take us out of Babylon. Resurrection. Yes, I believe in the resurrection. Beforehand. I'll explain where the second exodus goes in a second. He takes us to where? Mount Sinai. To do what? Enter into the what? Marriage covenant. Read Revelation 18, 19. It's all about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yes, exactly, exactly. Now, so the whole point is, he's going to take us out, take us to Mount Sinai, enter into covenant. Then what happens? Tribulation takes place. Now, here's a parallel. What happened, we all know, oh, let's just say it. They, got it. they got out of Egypt. And now all of a sudden, how long were they at Mount Sinai before Yahweh said, it's time to go to war? Anybody know? One year. One year. Why did he do one year? Because Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 5 says that if a man takes a woman to be his bride, he has one year not to go to war or have anything laid upon him. He entered into marriage covenant, he kept his law and did not go to war. When the honeymoon was over, number the men, time to go to war. And numbering the men, whoa, check this out. Why did David get in trouble for numbering the men? Because he wasn't supposed to. Yahweh numbers the men back here. He numbered everybody coming out and the numbers of men for battle. Then we have the 144,000 in Revelation. Well, who are they? Why are they numbered? When was the last time he numbered them? For war. These are the army. These are the, these are the men who will ride behind Yeshua at Armageddon. This is 144,000. I discussed this in my Church of Philadelphia teaching. I strongly encourage you to watch that teaching. It answers lots of questions. Okay. Now, I'm sorry, I still going to do q and I'll get there in a second. I want to lay a groundwork because a lot of you said you didn't watch any of my teachings. So, the whole element, he's at Mount Sinai with his bride. Satan takes the anti messiah surrounds Mount Sinai with his bride, and then attacks. He breaks the one year, cuts it short, then he saves his people. Where does he go next? Prophet says he goes to the tents of Judah. He saves Judah in Basra before he goes to Jerusalem. Prophets say that. He says he saves Ju the tents of Judah before he saves Jerusalem. It's all in this teaching, uh, Satan's Greatest Masquerade. Now, Basra, now let's do, if I can show you this one on a map. Here's Israel, okay? Here's Jordan. And then you got um, Saudi Arabia. Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia, right down here. On a map, Basra is just north-northeast of, of, of where Mount Sinai is at. When Yeshua said, flee to the, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded, flee to the, to the wilderness, to the mountains, these are the Jews who are believers in Yeshua who flee to Basra. Check it out. He even talks about, he's taken them there on what? Eagle's wings. Whoa, that sounds like Revelation, because it is. So the next part is, <laughs> the next thing you find he saves them, and then he makes its direct straight line on the east side of the Dead Sea, bringing life. He's resurrecting the Dead Sea, okay? And then when you get on the very top, if you look at the map, you look at the very, very, very tip top of the Dead Sea, and you are on the east side of it, and you go due west, guess what you're going to run into? 
the Mount of Olives. He comes from the east, heading due west, splits the Mount of Olives, enters into Jerusalem as the conquering king. And guess what? He's got blood on him because why? He just defeated the enemy back at Mount Sinai. It's all there in the prophets. We've got to get the church mentality of all these things we've learned out of our head and get into the prophets and dig into what they say. And am I saying all my stuff is right? No, but doggone it, I think I've got a lot of mixed truth in there. We just got to decipher where I'm right and where I'm wrong. Okay? I encourage you, please watch that teaching, Satan's Greatest Masquerade. Okay, that's the foundation for what I believe. Questions? <laughs> Everyone's going, what? Question right here. Make it loud so everyone can hear you. Okay, so it's just your question. Yes, um, and I'm just Steve. <laughs> so, uh, do you think that at, after the resurrection of the dead, believers can still die or be killed? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, F regarding the resurrection. Okay, first, um, if you don't, if you if you're still thinking Steve's off the deep end, believing in a preacher of resurrection, please, please, I'm begging you, please. Um, read my very short article simply titled Pre-Trib. I show how the prophets are saying there is a pre-trib resurrection. Yeshua himself said in Luke 21, 35, pray that you are able to escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man. Stand before the Son of Man is marriage language. Just stand before the Son of Man. What did they do whenever they're standing at Mount Sinai? Yahweh says, gather all the people and do what? Stand before the mountain. It's time for the marriage. What did they say? He said, I want you to do this, this, and another. What did they say? We will do what you said. They committed to the covenant. They stood before him. We're waiting for the new covenant. We're waiting for the marriage. We will stand before him. So, your question. Can someone die after the first resurrection? Absolutely. Because the first resurrection will be what I call the Church of Philadelphia. The 144,000 are the men of that group. Okay. Now, they will be with Yeshua at Mount Sinai. The other six churches will have to go to the time of purification. Because if you don't purify yourself now, you don't purify yourself now, He will purify you then. The tribulation is not for the world, it's for the body of the Messiah. He will purify His church and make them ready. Matter of fact, let's real quick. Did I answer your question? Because, the, because what happens is, then these people who survived the tribulation, Okay, because it says he cuts short. Because if he didn't cut the time short, no man would survive. That means he has his, there's still his people who need to be saved. Okay, so therefore he cuts that time short. And then in uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah also talks about the shepherds. He sends them out and brings them back. Okay, um, these are the people in their regular existing bodies will continue living through the millennium. In the millennium, we, by the end of the millennium, you have multiple population beyond reason. Matter of fact, check this out. Have you ever wondered why the Bible says in Revelation 21, 22, I think it's 21, where it says there'll be no more oceans? Have you ever wondered why? They will, during the millennium, they will continue to recede and recede and recede. Why? To make room for the population of this world that's going to be going crazy. Okay. And then that is fulfilling the promises. What did Yahweh say to Abraham? Your seed will be like what? The sands of the sea. Because why? They're living on the sands of the sea. They will be the sands of the sea. Where the seas are gone, there's your seed. They're all over. It's crazy cool how Yahweh just uses these things and overlaps them. Um, real quick, this, I'm going to pull up Isaiah because everyone likes to question the element of the second. Did I answer your question? Okay, because during, because even said during the millennium, it says if someone dies at the age of 100, they're considered what? A child. That means they're going to be the whole time. Remember, uh, um, Acts 21, no, no, not 21. Acts 3, 21 says that he must remain in heaven until, there be, until the restoration of all things. See, it's all about restoring all things. He's going to, then one of the things being restored is the how long we live. They live how long? So that will come back again. Another? You mean those who are resurrected? Those who are resurrected, those who are resurrected will have a, 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 a renewed body, just like Yeshua. Because Paul said that when he comes, we will be like him. So those who are, who are a part of the first resurrection will be having an eternal body that will not, it's incorruptible. And will that body 
First uh, Corinthians 15 is a great chapter, a whole chapter for that. Those bodies can still die until they eat the tree of the life, or is that? No, no. My understanding is that because it's incorruptible. Okay, but the tree of life is what keeps the, the freshness. It's, a, it's a, a way of life. Okay, it's like it's, that's what it is. And that's a whole different ball game. But yeah, but after, the, after you're resurrected, you can't die again. Okay, and, that's, and that's, that goes into an element of, um, well, what about those who are going to the lake of fire? Do they die? There's a, I believe, you may believe it, that um, you're just burned up and are no more. I don't hold to that because it's an incorruptible body. And when that which is incorruptible, it can't be corrupted. It's not going to die. It will. And that's why uh, also Isaiah talks about how um, the worm will never die, okay? Because it's corrupted and it's constantly corruption. An example, um, how much time have we got? The uh, element of when we lived on, in Costa Rica and we had a farm, we had a, I had a chicken die. It's really bumming a box. It was my favorite chicken, <laughs> my rooster. And, um, well, he died. I, had a, I was in the middle of several teachings. I couldn't go and bury him right away. So I just kind of set him to the side so the chickens wouldn't mess with him. You know what I'm saying? And then uh, I'm working on my teachings. And then the, 24 hours later, Angie goes, Steve, it's starting to stink up there. You know? And so I go, oh, man, I forgot about him. So I, I went out and I, I dug the hole first. You know? And then I got my shovel. And immediately I picked the, the chicken up. And there were worms all over. I mean, like the internal, you know, the gross stuff, you know what I'm saying? And immediately I'm going, it hit me, I'm going, the worm doesn't die. And the thing is, in hell, the lake of fire, it's eternal death. It's a constant eating of you, a constant, constant, the worm. Because what happens is, this is in, even in a human body, we have in parasites and all these different things that are in us that are keeping each other in check. But the second you stop the breath of life coming in, those parasites that overcome the negative parasites, well, they die. So the negative parasites then do what? Start eating your body. And as they grow, they become the worms. And when those worms start eating your body, okay, then when do they die? When your body is completely gone. Isaiah said their worm will never die. Okay, so that's a whole, that's, that's, a, that's the hell teaching thing. And I have a teaching on hell, not the eternal lake of fire, but uh, it's the Pharisees versus Sadducees. Because all the arguments you see today, those arguments were around in the first century. That's why I called it Pharisees versus Sadducees. Pharisees believed life after death, Sadducees didn't. Okay, we're, we're in the same argument, you know. Who's right? It's not a salvational issue, folks. I'm just telling you right now. So please don't divide over that type of topic. There's so many topics we can agree to disagree on, and that's definitely one of them. Um, Isaiah 24 uh, is about the earthquake. And let's go to Isaiah 66. Isaiah. Um, yeah, 66. I'll make my text a little bigger for you here so you can possibly read it. Talking about the second exodus. Now, Isaiah 66, you read it, it is all about the end times. Okay, I ain't going to go into all the details. Verse 15 talks about, it says, See, Yahweh is coming with fire, and his chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down his anger with fury. So this is talking about the very end wrath. Okay, we're talking about here now. Then, check this out. Verse 18. And I, because their actions and their imaginations, am about to come and gather all nations and tongues, and they will come and see my glory. 19. I will set a sign among them, and I will send some of those who survive to the nations to Tarshish, to the Libyans, and to the, and to the Lydians, famous as archers, to Tubal in Greece, and to distant islands that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. They will proclaim my glory among the nations, and they will bring all their brothers from all the nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering unto Yahweh on horses and chariots and wagons and on mules and camels, says Yahweh. They will bring them as the Israelites bring their grain offerings to the temple of Yahweh in a ceremonially clean vessels. That is the second exodus. They're all coming from all over. they got their camels, their carts, you name it. They're all coming at the end. They survived that tribulation and now they will enter into that millennium with Yeshua as king. That is the timing of the second exodus. I had a question. Yes, sir. Oh, you know what? He had to stand up first. Yes. 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 
Great. Okay, here's the thing. If you look at the whole story of Revelation, okay, it, uh, it's all summed up in one little sentence. It's a, par- it's, a, it's a whole parable of two women. The bride, the harlot, period. The bride is with Messiah. The harlot gets purified. That's it. Okay. And actually the harlot is going to be condemned if they don't get purified. And so the whole element of them being pure virgins, what's, that's us. It's all, it's all spiritual. What did Yahweh liken his people unto as? Harlotry. Okay, why? Because it was spiritual harlotry. The, we, the whole element is we have to think, focus on what was it, those words used in the Old Testament and what they applied for. Same principle here. If we're to be his bride, they're virgins. Okay? Yes. You know what? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I had to get him first. Go ahead. Do you think, that, do you think this is going to happen in one day then? What will happen in one day? Of Isaiah, Isaiah 66? Yes. It starts on one day. It won't happen in one day. Okay. Yeah, the resurrection is in a second. Okay? And then for what it's worth, I mentioned this in my teaching. Um, I think I mentioned it briefly in the birth pains teaching, which I just released two weeks ago, and in the timeline, uh, the winter timeline teaching. Isaiah 24 talks about a global earthquake. Okay? And everyone, you know, People are looking for the birth what Please watch my teaching the birth pains. There's a complete misunderstanding of the birth pains. People are looking for the birth pains. You don't want to see the birth pains. Because, check this out. Isaiah 26 talks about, well, let's just go there real quick, all right? Isaiah 26 says this. We're around verse 19, if I'm not mistaken. Let me get there. Yes. Check this out. Verse 19 says, but your dead will live. Their bodies will rise. Whoa, wait a second. That's a resurrection. Then it says, you who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. (coughs) Then what's it say? Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. I have a whole theory on that. We'll discuss that in a little bit if we get to it. The whole point is, here we see the earth giving birth to her dead. The earth giving birth to her dead. What are we looking for? The birth pains, right? Earth is giving birth. We're waiting for the birth pains. Now, let's go to Isaiah. What chapter was it? Oh, I'm forgetting it. I think it's 66, actually. Let's go to Isaiah 66. Oh, Father, I pray I'm right. Oh, here it is. Verse 7. Check it out. Before she goes into labor, she gives birth. Before the pains come upon her, she delivers a son before the pains come the birth we don't want to see the birth pains that's why yeshua said pray you escape all these things and stand before the son of man make sense now check this out too because it says she gives birth to a son you ever read revelation chapter 12 what does the virgin give birth to a son revelation 12 is right here Okay, the prof, the, Revelation is the prophet, the prophets, we just got to find the links, okay? And seriously, when I mentioned about the wings of an eagle, just do word search, wings of an eagle, and you'll find how Yahweh takes his people to Basra. And, it's, and, that's, and he's taken the, the people of Israel, Judah at that time, I think, the, the, the unbelieving Jews at that time. I'm sorry? As he did in Exodus. As he did in Exodus. Okay, now, does that make sense? I didn't know what led us there. I had a question, and I'm, I'm rambling, so forgive me. Uh, you had a question. I did. Um, so on your timeline, yes. right, you talk about, um, let's go back there real quick. Yeah, I'm going to try to bring it up if I can. Okay. So, so right there you have Yeshua takes the bride to Mount Sinai, right? That's uh, in your teaching the Church of Philadelphia. Right? I do, yes. And then you have the first right resurrection here. right there. That's where we see Thessalonians, right? The dead in Christ rise. Correct. First, first Thessalonians chapter 4. And, and then they go, mm-hmm. right? Well, in Ezekiel 20, as I mentioned a little while ago, um, talks about how he's going to meet with us face-to-face as he did our forefathers. Correct. At Sinai. Correct. Now, Meaning face-to-face. Okay, did anybody hear him? Yeah. Talk loud. Yeah, so, so at that point, he says that he is going to separate, right, the sheep from the sheep, as he says in 34, but also in 20, he says 
He's going to purge the rebels from among us. Yes. What is your take on who those rebels are? Okay. Uh, what teaching do I discuss this in? I discussed this in the Church of Philadelphia teaching. I discussed that teaching specifically. Okay. Um, have, you know. Because I've watched it and I just don't remember. So I'll, I am 99.9% .9 sure it's the Church of Philadelphia teaching. Okay. Because it talks about that. Um, you know, a lot of times someone will ask me a question. I got to say, hold on a second. Let me go watch my teaching and see what I believe. And so, because um, <laughs> there's so much to them, I can't remember it all. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, but in that element, uh, well, let's, let's just go there real quick. What was the verse again you Ezekiel mentioned? Ezekiel 20, and it starts um, in verse 38. And one thing, Steve, we're going to have to wrap up before noon. Okay. Um, they're going to have to have this room at noon. So. Okay. If you take this question and ask that, Okay, then, so we'll have to make that last. Okay, okay. well, this one might take some time. Let me look real quick. What was the verse again? Ezekiel 20, verse 38. Because he's bringing out both the dead that were risen, right? Yes. Now, those who died in Christ, right? Uh-huh. We assume that those okay, were yes. okay. believers. Okay, yes, okay. Right, 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 right. Okay, here's the thing. There's the word in the NIV and most all of the translations I bring it out in the teaching. I do address this in the teaching church of Philadelphia. Okay, so um, it, the word for purge there is not a good word just to, to um, for that. The better word is to actually can be select. I will select you from the rebels. Okay. So this is the selection where he pulls his bride out from those of his overall body. So you can think of it this way. The church of Philadelphia then? Yes. Because these are all, it gives kind of the indication that they're all at Sinai. I'm with you. But he's taking them to Sinai. These are the ones he takes to Sinai. Okay, think of it this way. The, sh the sheep pen, okay? And, and then this, and then this uh, teaching, I discuss how, oh man, it discusses the shepherd and how w every tent belonged to Yahweh. Sure. Every tent that passed under the rod belonged to Yahweh. Okay, and this is the, the whole picture, and uses this, this whole verse, I mentioned this in the teaching, this is where it's the tenth of the body of Messiah, okay, the true bride who has made themselves ready, that's the tenth who will be with him at Mount Sinai. Every tenth one is mine, every tenth one is mine. I select you from the rebels, those, because if you're not purifying yourself in his eyes, you're rebelling. Okay, you're the former or you're against me. We can claim him all, I, all we want, but if we hold on to any little hidden sin and we want to cherish it, <clears throat> purification is coming your way, baby. I'm just telling you, it doesn't matter how small it is. We want to be pure before Him. If you don't purify yourself, He will purify you. Let me close on this note. Please see that teaching, the Church of Philadelphia, because I address that in detail. Okay? Um, smack, what was I going to say? Folks, the thing is this. Everyone wants to be a part of the Church of Philadelphia. Everyone claims to be a part of the Church of Philadelphia. Do we know what the Church of Philadelphia means? It's called the Church of Brotherly Love. Philadelphia. You're sitting down, it's a good thing. If you aren't loving your neighbor, I can promise you now, you are not in the Church of Philadelphia. I'm just telling you like it is. And right now, this is a great end, thing to end out with. This is the ultimate test. I was talking to somebody the other day. Every single one of us, including me, all of us, will fall into one of the seven churches when all hell breaks loose. All these things that we're going through, these hard times, these difficult times, this person hurt me here. I'm doing this here. They're doing that wrong here. These are the times of testing that he is testing us to see what decision we're going to make. <clears throat> Excuse me. What decision we're going to make to love our brother or to not love them. To hold a grudge or to offer the hand of forgiveness. Because if we don't, you will not be in the Church of Philadelphia. I'm telling you, I've talked to so many people who have gone through so many hard times just in this last weekend. And we're all going through these times where we've been official. You know what? Do you know how many times we've all been hurt? I can't. Really? 
We all have been done wrong legitimately. We could probably take people to court and legitimately have an awesome case to win. Forgive. Is it worth it? And I mean forgive from your heart, not just words. Forgive from your heart. If you see them, love them. They need you. Yes, they've done you wrong. And you didn't do Yeshua wrong? You haven't done wrong? This is the ultimate test, what we're all going through. We are all going through this now. Make sure you make the right decisions every day. Every day we go through this stuff. And it's only going to get worse as time concludes. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we praise you. I thank you again for this time to be with your people. Be with us now, Father, because we continue on in this, in this weekend. Let it be an awesome time for you. Let us learn and grow and love together. In Yeshua's holy name, and everyone agree by saying, Amen, amen and Amen. Okay.